Hello, this is Anthony Effinger. I'm the host of the Think Neuro podcast here at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute. And today, I am sitting down with Dr. Omid Medizadeh. He's an otolaryngologist and a laryngologist, and we're gonna find out what that is. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So tell me about your discipline. So I specialize in the field of otolaryngology, which is commonly known as ear, nose, and throat, or ENT. Okay. Um, and I did further subspecialization. I did a year of fellowship in a field called laryngology. And laryngology specifically focuses on disorders of the voice, uh, swallowing, as well as airway. Okay. So um, breathing not related to the nose or the sinuses, but breathing more related to the vocal cords and the um, portion of the trachea or the windpipe just below the vocal cords. So the Odo in this case denotes? Ear. Ear. Yes. Okay, so yes. laryngologist is everything down. Yes, so people, the... people generally know it as throat. Yeah. Um, but it's more, even more specifically, it's the voice box. Okay. Specific, yes. Now, did I saw in your bio that you've worked with opera singers. Yes. So I, I had the opportunity of doing my residency out in New York at NYU. And my professors there were very involved in opera sing with opera singers, so rotating through their clinics. I had the opportunity to see how my mentors would work with them and engage in the types of um, pathologies and difficulties that they would endure. These were essentially people who would sing one to two shows a day, six days a week. So you could imagine the amount of strain and hours that were being endured on those vocal cords. So we would quite commonly see pathologies including nodules, cysts, which are fluid-filled mm. cavities, um, polyps, and even bruises and bleeds for acute um, injuries. So many times you hear about singers who need to cancel tours. Um, it's usually due to one of those types of injuries that are being developed during the tour. When somebody says voice box, do they mean vocal cords? Yes. So the voice box in men is known as the, the top of the voice box in men is the Adam's apple. Um, so that's the tip of the cartilage uh, that contains the vocal cords. There's two vocal cords. There's a left cord and a right cord. And there's many other structures in there, uh, structures in there that allow the vocal cords to move um, over, I believe, oh, uh, approximately five or six paired muscles that are no, no thicker than a fingernail. So these things are... Uh, are quite delicate and quite remarkable in what they're able to produce. Yeah, I was gonna ask, what do they? If, what do they look like? What is your? What do vocal cords look like? Are they these sheaths of muscle that you just described? They're they're multiple layers. Okay. Uh, so the skeleton of the vocal cord is made up of the um, what we call the thyroid, which the tip of that is the Adam's apple, um, and then there's uh, three more. There's one more cartilage under that. That's like a ring. That's called the cricoid, and then there's other cartilages called arytenoids. That's part of the joint. So the vocal cords essentially are paired of um, um, multi-level tissue that involve a ligament, uh, a muscle, and layers of connective tissue ranging from tough connective tissue to nearly gelatinous con connective tissue, and then what we call the epithelium or the lining. And that lining is similar to the pink lining inside your mouth um, or inside your throat. Okay. So I always compare vocal cords to a guitar string. So you pluck, a, well, you pluck a guitar string, it vibrates, it creates a frequency. So what plucks our vocal cord is the air that goes through from our lungs through them, and the vocal cords vibrate and create what we call the fundamental frequency of our voice. And the, and the muscles there can modulate that frequency or modulate the... Yes. Yeah, so the muscles can contract and relax. The, uh, the thyroid itself, which is attached to the vocal cords, can tilt forward and tilt back. So again, like a guitar string, more tension on the cord, the higher the frequency goes. Um, and then there's other paired muscles uh, behind the vocal cords attached to the joints that allow the vocal cords to move up in space, mm. as well as to rotate three-dimensionally oh along gosh. an axis in space. Um, so the vocal cords are shortening, elongating, moving in, moving out, moving up, moving down, and rotating in or out, 
all at the same time to produce voice. So this is like the most um, sophisticated, one of the most sophisticated kind of musical instruments. It's beautiful. It's, it's quite remarkable. That, that's one of the reasons I went into ENT or head and neck as a specialty to start, because it's some of the most intricate and beautiful types of structures in our human body that are able to interact with others, that are able to perceive the world outside of us. And all these, all these things are controlled by nearly microscopic nerves mm. and, you know, again, things that if you just tugged on so gently with terror and you, someone could lose their voice potentially. How big is this entire structure? Uh, the entire structure, the vocal cords themselves are approximately a centimeter and a half to two centimeters in length, depending on children, women, men. Um, the entire voice box is about, I would say, um, four centimeters in height hmm. um, and about four to five centimeters um, in length as well. But the whole structure is probably about, is that eight centimeters hmm. or so? Yeah. And is this something you can see looking down somebody's throat? You have to do what's either called a, uh, you have to do what's called a laryngoscopy. Okay. So um, back in the day before we had endoscopes, uh, people would look at the vocal cord with mirrors. So uh, I'm not sure if you remember ever growing up, your doctor would hold your tongue and put a little mirror in the back of your throat. Yeah. Um, what they're actually doing was looking down at your throat at your vocal cords. So that's a common thing that we do in, in the office, um, especially if we just want a quick look. But what truly gives us the most detailed look, and these days we have amazing technology that allows us to visualize the cords with HD quality. Um, it's called a laryngoscopy. So you, typically what we do is we put a very small scope, um, endoscope uh, through the nose after numbing somebody and look with a camera right through down the, the nose. Way, through the nose. There are, Does that get you back? Yeah, so it gets us back yeah. behind th into the throat and then we, we go down and look down here. Okay. Yes. And, um, and there's many different types of endoscopes. There's flexible, which is the one that goes through the nose, and then there's rigids that are actually cameras that angle down that look straight down at the vocal cords, but you could do that through the mouth. Sure, sure. You have to turn that corner. Well, you don't, the camera just goes straight yeah. back and looks, but yes, yeah. with the flexible That's what you're scope, trying to do. Yes, yeah. yes. And, um, and then there's another layer of technology on top of that called stroboscopy. So it's a special, think of it as a high-speed camera um, that is actually able to look at the vibration of that lining. So with a regular light, all you see are the vocal cords going in and out. But with this type of special light called stroboscopy, it actually, um, the frequency of the light that's coming out is actually the same frequency of the vibration of the vocal cords. Um, in men, it's generally 150 hertz. So the vocal cord actually vibrates in and out about 150 times a second and it's able to break that down and look at it position by position. So we're actually seeing that hmm. lining go in hmm. and out. What's the, what's the rate for women? Uh, women, it's higher. So women are near 200 to 220. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. So coming back to the opera singers, mm -hmm. what was bringing them in? It was just, it was, this is sort of like a muscle or an instrument that's just being overplayed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So which is why it's so important for those singers and those performers uh, to have appropriate voice coaching and training. And many, of course, all of them by that stage do. Okay. They do. So yeah, they were coming in with fatigue. So yeah. they would start to feel strain or ache. Mm. Um, the most common, uh, the most common issue would be hoarseness. Mm. Or I'm just unable to reach the notes I used to reach and I don't sound how I used to sound. And what's causing that? So um, if there was an issue, it would be usually something structural with the vocal cord. Um, so it would be like nodules, which are essentially inflammatory um, calluses of the vocal cord or a traumatic lesion um, like a bruise or a hemorrhage or a bleed. And essentially, that's what a hemorrhage is. Mm. Um, other times, quite rarely, it would be a very mild weakness, neurologic weakness of mm. the vocal cord. Um, but typically, if we did not find any pathology on the vocal cord, we would provide reassurance, we would discuss their situation or their care with their voice coach, and we would come up with a plan to try to rehabilitate them. And you can, there's, there's steps you can take. There's steps you can take. Um, again, unfortunately, if there's a traumatic lesion on yeah. the vocal cord, a lot of times they would have to stop singing and mm. recover before they could actually get back to their routine. You know, my mother had um, polyps on her blues on her vocal cords mm -hmm. and she before she had them removed she had this very gravelly right. voice right and then she had them removed and her voice you know 
Was she a smoker? But yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's why uh, when you said polyps, plural, um, typically people who are long-time smokers develop a lot of swelling and eventually polyps on both vocal cords. Yeah. So that's why a lot of smokers have that deep, raspy voice. Those are those are polyps. We call them rankies, rankies edema. Um, so that gelatinous layer under the lining is called the Ranke space. Mm. And essentially over time of smoking over years and years, Ranke space becomes very thick and gelatinous. So we go in there and remove it and it improves the voice. Substantially. Yeah, it was, it was like, it was, uh, you know, in the course of a week after she gets, begins speaking again, it was different. Yeah, yeah, it's great. So what brings people in here? In here, I see patients with, um, again, hoarseness. So a lot of my patients describe a raspy voice, um, deeper than they would expect it to be. A, um, a hoarse voice is a commonly used term. Um, and in addition to that, they may sometimes describe this term we call vocal fatigue. Uh, so a lot of these people are singers, mm. lawyers, teachers, um, people who are required to speak all day without mm. rest and they're at some point they're just unable to sustain themselves anymore so it's actually interfering with their daily lives both socially as well as their vacation so they come in to see me to see why their vocal cords are weak or why their voice is weak and what do you what can you do so we always start with this uh, we always get the history with any mm. patient we always obtain the history how long has this been going on um, if there was any preceding event for example did they go out was there a shouting because um, shouting could be very traumatic yeah on the vocal cords yeah, I've had that happen yeah like shouting at kids sporting events yeah right? and then the I next... wasn't that guy <laughs> good you went okay. I just got a little loud you wouldn't get in fights was, with it the was coaches. encouraging it wasn't was it yelling at an umpire or okay. a ref or anything like that? Okay, good. So, uh, I'm sure the but next that one day, event, I mm -hmm. did something. You're right, right. So, so what, ha what happened there? They would, so if it's temporary, it's usually what we call an acute laryngitis. So I'm sure if you've ever ran too hard, you woke up the next day and you had an achy knee or an achy ankle. Um, so it's essentially the same thing with the vocal cords. That constant shouting and overuse mm. or misuse um, can cause a lot of swelling or mm. inflammation. Just like any cords. muscle. Just like any muscle. Okay. So the vocal cords get swollen. Okay. And people develop an acute laryngitis, so we typically recommend voice rest um, until the until it resolves. Until it resolves. Now, a lot of times, if people are, are at that level consistently, that type of acute laryngitis could eventually develop these nodules on the vocal cords. And think of nodules as um, calluses. I was gonna say. Uh Calcis scar tissue -y? Yeah, no. thick, thick in okay, lining. Okay, okay. Exactly. So, you know, you walk all day, the, the ankle's rubbing up against the shoe, you you know, you have a thick kind of, yeah. like the skin is thick there. That's essentially what a nodule is. So people who have to speak a lot, um, people who shout a lot, mm. are social butterflies, mm. um, tend to have nodules. <laughs> um, people who clear their throat a lot for a variety of reasons, whether there's an irritation from allergies or a chronic acid reflux as well, oh, sure. can yeah. develop nodules. Um, at times, if it's um, severe enough, they can develop what's called a traumatic lesion. So a traumatic lesion can include a polyp or a cyst on the vocal cord. That's the next... Yeah, so it, I wouldn't think of it necessarily as a spectrum, but okay. any of those can occur. Okay, yes. okay. Yes. Um, so do you then remove those things? So we, we do this stroboscopy, we see what's going on with the vocal cord, if there's anything structural there, functionally there, um, like I said, also a neurologic weakness, um, if there are signs of acid reflux within the voice box as well, and um, Treatment really depends on the patient. It truly depends on the patient. Um, you know, we, we like to reassure our patients more than anything. So if it's something benign, uh, treatment really depends on their schedule and how they would like to proceed. Mm. Um, of course, if we have any suspicion of any type of cancer or malignancy, that changes the picture. Um, but typically with uh, the standard of treatment with nodules is voice therapy. Hmm. So there's actual, uh, there are actual specialists who are very 
helpful and quite crucial to, crucial to our field called speech language pathologists or SLPs. Um, so a lot of people know them as um, speech therapists with children. Yeah. Um, but they also specialize in adult voice. So they work with singers or just anybody who has vocal cord issues. So what they were essentially doing is they're they're allowing the patient to relearn how to speak in order to resolve these inflammatory issues. So behavior, if you change your behavior, you yes. can. Do the nodules recede or go away or do they nodules stay? Nodules do. They do, yes. with, with training. With training, unless the nodules have been there for so long that they've scarred. So, okay. Okay, so right. they, they can get there, they can be there for quite a while and they, be, they can become so inflamed mm. that even after you change the way you speak, it, it doesn't go away and that requires surgery. Okay. Um, but again, none of these require surgery. It depends on the patient and when they have, if they have time for that and when is best for them to proceed with surgery. So other lesions like cysts and polyps have a lower likelihood of resolving with voice therapy. Um, they can, but the likelihood is much lower. Um, so if a patient tells me this is not the right time for me, I hook them up, I refer them to a voice therapist, try to optimize their voice <clears throat> use, vocal behavior, and then when the time is right, and if the lesion hasn't resolved, then we go and proceed with surgery for these patients. Okay. And do the, are the people you're seeing, do they, are you the people who've been referred from other doctors, how do people find you? All, all types of referrals. So people find me um, online. Uh, they find me uh, through other doctors. They're referred to me by other doctors or word of mouth. Okay. And what percentage of people do you see? You mentioned that you see singers and lecturers and mm -hmm. professors. Is that, I mean, do you tend to see mostly professionals? Uh, with these types voice of Voice professional type people or? I would say the two most common groups of people that I see with um, chronic voice issues are either professionals or younger, um, younger patients who are very socially active. Oh, and they've, interesting. Yes. So young people aren't just staring at their phones. They're actually no. going out and talking. Yeah, if they're going hey. out, they're going to Good. concerts, they're going to the bars, and yeah. they're just shouting over the music, and they like speaking on the phone. Um, a lot of you know people, late teenagers, early 20s, is a very common demographic. That's so interesting. Yes. And then in addition, I imagine you have, a, I mean, this being LA, you must have a number of singers and performers who... I have, I have, yes, I do, I yeah. do. Um, and then a third group of patients I usually see are those with neurologic issues with ah. the vocal cords. So um, being here at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute, we see a lot of patients with a variety of neurologic conditions. Um, so patients with Parkinson's disease have a very interesting uh, manifestation in their vocal cords. Um, there's a condition called Parkinson's hypophonia, which essentially means that in Parkinson's disease, the voice becomes very soft. Mm. And in some cases, that's actually the first presentation. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, I have a friend who, God rest his soul, died of Parkinson's. I'm sorry. And yeah, but he that happened. Yes, yeah. yeah. So his voice started getting softer yeah. and softer. Yeah. And um, I have found, I have seen two patients with Parkinson's hypophonia who I refer to neurologists who were eventually diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. That they was were, the first sign. Yeah, that was the first sign. Um, other types of neurologic conditions could include a paralysis of a vocal cord. Mm. So most paralyses are um, spontaneous and, uh, mean, and idiopathic. What that means is there's no rhyme or reason as know. to why the vocal cord just goes weak. Um, but other issues typically include an injury of the nerve that feeds the vocal cord. Uh, we call that the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So essentially starts in the neck and uh, branches off a larger nerve, actually goes down into the chest and wraps back up around the chest and back into the neck. So it could uh, conceivably be injured at any point in its course. So common injuries would include thyroid surgery hmm. uh, because the nerve runs right behind the thyroid gland. Um, so one of the major components of thyroid surgery is to actually dissect or safely remove the nerve off the thyroid gland, separate the two, so you're not injuring the nerve. Oh, interesting. Yes, okay. so it's, you know, we quote the, depending on the surgeon, um, the rate of injury can range anywhere from 0% to 
1% on average we say, I'm sorry, 2% on average we say 1%. Of course, a lot of surgeons like to um, have a 0% complication rate mm. um, with regards to the nerve, but it's, it's, an, it's an innate risk with the surgery, unfortunately. Um, thoracic surgery or chest surgery is another common mm. reason why people may develop a paralysis of the cord because these nerves are wrapping around the large vessels coming off the heart. That's or going so to the heart. So when they're in there and they're doing some type of um, massive surgery on the, on the heart, it's very commonly injured. So patients wake up with a very weak, breathy voice. And they also have swallowing issues uh, because the cords are, un are unable to close and protect the lungs. So the gateway to the lungs, which is the vocal cords, are unable to come together because one of them is paralyzed. So now they're coughing on liquids um, and they're, they're, un they're unable so to what, eat So what safely. can you do here then? So with those patients, we, um, if we know the nerve is cut, uh, we temporize them. Uh, What's with, that mean? We, we basically inject a filler material into the vocal cord um, that can last anywhere from six weeks to one and a half years. And essentially with this injectable material, think of it as facial fillers. Um, we're just plumping up the vocal cord so that we're able to physically move it over towards the vocal cord that's moving and they're able to meet and the patient could have a strong voice again. Interesting. And now the vocal cords can completely close so they stop choking on liquids and feel like things are going down the wrong way. And now a message from our sponsor. The Think Neuro podcast is brought to you by Pacific Neuroscience Institute Foundation, a nonprofit 501c3 organization. If you're inspired by what you hear and wish to support our mission of education through innovation, please visit pacificneuro.org foundation. Okay, so that brings us to another thing you see, uh, swallowing disorders. Mm -hmm. And I know in Parkinson's, that's often what, when people can no longer swallow, that's... Indeed, you know, that's one of the late stages yeah, of late Parkinson's. Yeah, late-stage terrible yes, things. Yes. Talk about the um, relationship between the vocal cords and swallowing. Is, you, it's intertwined. Okay. It's intertwined. Okay, why? So the vocal cords provide, they allow us to breathe. They open, we can breathe. They close uh, to protect the lungs when we swallow. When things go through the vocal cords into the lungs when we eat, that's called aspiration. Mm -hmm. And essentially the vocal cords prevent aspiration or at least are one aspect of the swallowing mechanism. So patients with hoarseness, you have to understand why they're having hoarseness. So if it's just a uh, a benign lesion or nodule on the vocal cord, they shouldn't have any swallowing issues. But if it's something uh, more serious, like a paralysis of the vocal cord or a history of stroke that's causing weakness and paralysis of the muscles of the throat as well as the vocal cord, then that concerted, um, quite regulated swallow function is not working properly. So even a smallest drop of water, imagine a, a gulp of water, right? This thing is trying to go down all together into the esophagus, into the back of the throat and into the esophagus and eventually into the stomach. So if the organization of the muscles are not working correctly, then that what we call bolus or piece of food or water falls apart and can go down the wrong way. Okay, yes. so we're the, the, so the vocal we're calling on the vocal cords to do quite a bit here. I mean, yes. it's enough really to control voice, but to I mean swallowing and everything. I mean, so the the this is a yeah. No, right. I was going to say the the primary function of the vocal cords is to protect our airway. Interesting. Is, is to protect our lungs. Okay. Um, the secondary function, also extremely important, is breathing. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then the a, a, a third function that's as crucial is swallowing. And then a fourth function is speaking. Okay. So how did you become interested in this and decided to make this your career? So I had the opportunity of um, doing a research fellowship uh, with my mentor at UC Davis. Um, his name is Peter Belofsky. And he is one of the um, foremost experts, international experts in swallowing disorders. Hmm. Um, his passion for th what we do is quite... 
amazing and quite motivating. So I had the opportunity during medical school, uh, which I did at UC Davis in Sacramento, uh, to spend a year with him. So you're in medical school, you don't know exactly what you're gonna do yet. I knew I wanted to do ENT. You knew you wanted to do ENT, yes. okay. So you find him. I find him, okay. he offered me a year, uh, he offered me the opportunity to be with him for a year and do research under him. And that was, an amazing opportunity. It was. It taught me so many things on so many levels, um, in terms of academics, research, um, just how to be an amazing doctor. From mm. him, he he was. A, he's a wonderful mentor. I still mm. I still speak to him very regularly, and um, after that, I graduated medical school and I went to NYU, and I I was surveying the different special I knew I wanted to do a subspecialty early on um, and that essentially means uh, pursuing a fellowship after residency to subspecialize. So your residency it was at NYU? At NYU. In? In ENT, in okay. otolaryngology. Okay. Head and neck surgery. Okay. And then you do the fellowship. And then I do the fellowship. And exactly. that was what? So the I essentially was trying to figure out what to do and he offered me a fellowship position. So after I graduated from uh, residency, I went back to UC Davis and spent another oh, yeah spent another year with him. And this is what we call the clinical fellowship. So I'm still doing research, um, and but I spent a lot of my time with him as well as my other mentor Maggie Kuhn, um, yeah, in the office learning the tricks of the trade, learning yeah. the practice operating with them and learning some remarkable things. Fantastic. And now how did you find PNI and come here? So that was, you know, you know, they say in life, um, things happen for a reason. Um, and I think PNI was one of those things. Hmm. Uh, when I was at NYU, I had met a, um, a company representative, a device representative who worked with Chester Griffiths, one of my ah. colleagues here. And uh, she put me in touch, and he asked if I wanted to come and interview, and you know the rest is. And how long ago was that? Uh, I started here three years ago. Okay. Yeah, I've been here for. Th I'm just finishing my third year. Yeah, Dr. Griffiths is great. We've He's interviewed amazing. Him on yeah, another podcast. another He's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, another great mentor. Yeah. What was the device? I'm just curious. What sort of device? It was a sinus it device. <laughs> it yeah. was a. It was a. Um, I believe it was a sinus balloon. What's that? So in um, sinus surgery, a lot of times patients have um, congestion or obstruction, blockage of the pathways of the sinuses that drain into the nose. So the sinuses are essentially air-filled spaces mm. in our skull, in our forehead, in our cheeks. And at times, these passages become very narrow. Uh, so we need to open them. So these sinus balloons are more uh, modern technology of essentially allowing us to open those sinus passages. We just put a small balloon into the passage and open it up and it creates a one to two millimeter opening into a one centimeter opening. It can so, do that. So now those sinuses can drain. How do you, how, what are the other methods, methods for doing that? Because I know work? people who've had that uh, proceed, not the procedure with the balloon, but other they did something else to open the sinuses, and it was... Um... Yeah, so the, the traditional method, if we need to actually remove something from the sinus or further open that sinus cavity, it's called an entrostomy, where we surgically break down the small, thin bone. Yeah, and that's what he had. Yes, yeah, so we, we do that very commonly as ENTs as well. Okay, and, you, and that's somebody who's got... He has... Um, terrible allergies and mm -hmm. I think some asthma, but somehow his sinuses were quite closed off. Right, so allergies, sinus infections, yes. polyps in the sinuses, um, that that type of that type of issue. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So what so what what where does it where does your practice break down? How much is sort of Odo and how much is Laryngology. Yes. So I would say right now I'm about at 50-50. Uh, really? Yeah. So half of my practice is general ENT, so sinus work, um, you know, standard ear things uh, like ear infections and hearing loss and vertigo, mm. um, as well as tonsil issues, oral issues, um, head and neck cancer as yeah. well. So thyroid and you, cancer. you remove those? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So thyroid cancer, parotid cancer. Um, tongue cancer, ton tonsil cancer, things like that. Yeah. And then the other half is purely laryngology. So okay. um, voice and swallowing predominantly. 
Are people still removing tonsils the way they did in the old days? If we need to. Not in the old days. Remember, not in I the old had days. mine out like, yes. you know, I, they didn't even have a chance. I think I was five. Yeah, there was a, there was a generation where yeah. it was commonly recommended to remove them. Yeah, and, and what are they? The tonsils are, um, they're what we call lymphatic tissue, lymphoid tissue. They're involved in, the, um, in developing our immunity our immune system. Uh -huh. So there's nests of cells in there, white blood cells, um, that are meant to sample the outside world. So anything that comes through, uh, viruses, dirt, bacteria, um, they're meant to sample and develop immunity against. So why should we, should, sounds like, that sounds like something we should keep. At some point, they don't really work. At some point, they don't, we don't need our tonsils to do that for us anymore. Okay, I feel um, better. Yeah, so at some point, we don't need our tonsils to do that for us. There's many, many other areas in our body, including our throat, um, as well as our GI tract that continue to do that. Um, and if the tonsils are causing more trouble than they're helping, we just remove you them. You do, so you still do that. Yeah, so common reasons to remove the tonsils would be uh, recurrent tonsil infections or tonsillitis, um, and in rare cases, as an adult, uh, cancer. Really? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So this sounds like a little bit of a, the body um, having a, this extra thing that maybe it's a belt and suspenders in terms of mm -hmm. um, infection. Yes. Yeah. I mean, okay. our, again, our our body is remarkable. It is. In I mean, what it more does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't like to use the word miracle, um, but it's it's so complex. Yeah. And the brain is one of the most, or if not the most, complex thing that we that exists on this planet. Um, and the fact that we're able to do what we do every single day for decades and not break down until later on, hopefully, is remarkable. It is. And we take it for granted. We do take it for granted. Yeah. I think that's why it's so important for us to respect our bodies and to treat them well. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so a couple, just a couple of uh, old wives tales, myths kind of thing. Uh -huh. uh, everybody, you know, you get horse, they, they say lemon and honey. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you get horse, it's only for a few days. Um, it's usually either, again, something viral um, or something traumatic. So, you know, just kind of nurse yourself, treat yourself But well. is there anything, why lemon? Um, is, and is there any science to that? You, people, you know, the lemon is an antioxidant. It has vitamin C. It's supposed to boost our immune system. So I believe that's why lemon. Um, and in terms of warm tea, it's soothing. It yeah, feels, it feels good. So okay. I'm I'm all for it. You're you're okay with I'm the, all for it. the yes. tea with lemon and honey. Yeah, yeah, I'm not for people putting cloves of garlic in their nose, which is one of the most recent. Kind Excuse of, me. Yes, um, recent fads on TikTok is what I've heard recently um, to act as an anti-inflammatory or anti-infection. Um, I think that's taken a little bit too far. Okay, so you. <laughs> Putting a clove of garlic in your nose. Into your nose. Yes. And breathing through your mouth? What? I'm, you would be the first to know why people are doing this. I have no idea why people Have are you doing been called upon to remove any of these yet? Not, not garlic cloves. Not garlic cloves. But unfortunately, some kids do put things in their nose sometimes, like beads or peanuts. So, and we have to go fishing for those. How, really? Oh, yeah. And they get pretty far up oh, there? Oh, yeah. The kids are really good at yeah, getting They get them up there. They can. They <laughs> Legos? Can. Uh, Legos, um, I mean, in their you, ears. Really? All sorts of things. Yes. Really? I was kidding about the Legos. No, no. I've taken Sir? a Lego out before. Yeah, like a small Lego. I've taken one out. Out uh, of somebody's nose. Yeah, I think I've taken out a Lego, peanut with the husk, um, <laughs> and, and beads of all types. Beads. Beads. Beads, yeah. Um, in fellowship, one child uh, swallowed a handful of pebbles. Uh -huh. um, so I had to unfortunately put him under anesthesia and go into his lungs. And get the pebbles out of his the lungs. Pebbles out. There are at least six pebbles lodged into his airway and his lungs. So we had to go in there and take those out. Did those lodge in his lungs because they were pebbles? Well, or we, yeah. why? I mean, they didn't just go down. We don't know why. Yeah. I, you know, you would expect him to swallow every single one. Um, yeah. But the story that we got was that he had a whole handful. So I think a majority of them did get swallowed. But I think if, if like five or six of them, uh, unfortunately, fell into his, he aspirated them. Mm. And um, he was, essentially, he had a cough for three weeks. Are you serious? Yeah. And so his mother brought him in. They x-rayed him. They saw the lungs were blocked. And we 
put him under general anesthesia, um, put a very specific type of instrument called a rigid bronchoscope, um, which is essentially a rigid metal tube uh, through his vocal cords, through the mouth, through his vocal cords, into the lungs, and got graspers that were just as long, and um, plucked each Pulled one out, out one by one looked at every single airway because they would this what happened the think of the lungs as a tree yeah so you have the you have the um, trunk which is the air which is the trachea or the windpipe and then it branches off into smaller and smaller airways so at some point it gets lodged okay so then what is that tissue where the where the pebble is lodged what is that tissue like Inflamed. And but is it? I mean, what's like? Is it like saran wrap? Is it like what is oh, it? What is it? it? We call it mucosa, mm. uh, which is again, it's this glistening type of lining that's mm. inside our throat and our mouth. Every every air every structure of muco, or I should say, every area of our body has different types of mucosa. So our mouth has a very specific type of mucosa. Um, our esophagus has a different type, our stomach has a different mm. type, our lungs, our um, colon, our small intestine, and each one of these mucosas is um, has a, has a specific job, okay. and that's why each mucosa is different. So the job of the mucosa in the lungs is to um, is to one support the structure of the airway. So some of these um, passageways have cartilage that's supposed to keep them open so they don't collapse yeah. in when we breathe. Um, and then other areas have these tiny little um, hair-like cells called cilia. Um, we have cilia in our nose as well that are all beating in the same direction uh, to push things out. So when you go in and when you went in and took out those pebbles then, that that tissue just recovers. It recovers from this, over time. From this yes. pebble and the... Yeah, from the local that, injury. Yeah, generally. yeah, yeah. And you know the idea is that you want to ensure that that lung is, part of the lung is aerating. Yeah. Um, that it's getting air when we breathe, otherwise you could develop a pneumonia back there. Sure. And that's the same picture with what we call an aspiration pneumonia. Um, so that's something that I really, I work with commonly and I'm quite passionate about. Which is, describe uh, that. So aspiration pneumonia are people who cannot swallow or at least cannot swallow safely are um, food is falling into the lungs and it sits there oh my and gosh. it festers. So uh, my work, my passion is preserving people's swallow function and ensuring that their swallow function is safe. Why are, why, why are these people having trouble swallowing? So many reasons. Lots of reasons. So many reasons. Like so Parkinson's? Parkinson's, other neurologic conditions, um, vocal cord paralysis. Unfortunately, a very common one are people who've been treated for head and neck cancer with chemotherapy and or radiation. And Which does what? It um, just, it, it causes severe trauma, mm. harm, and scarring and neurologic injury to the throat and the muscles of the throat and they're just unable to swallow so these people develop two three four episodes of pneumonia sometimes they're hospitalized for it and sometimes they're put on a breathing tube with a breathing tube or on a ventilator mm -hmm. and at times we have to tell these people that they cannot swallow and they cannot eat and all their nutrition has to come via feeding tube mm. but again my passion my goal in life is to preserve their swallow function as long as I can. And that's typically done via a combination of uh, swallow therapy with these same people, these speech language pathologists, to try to get them to swallow more safely or to rehabilitate their swallow function. Um, and at times, surgical intervention. To what would you do in, in say, what surgical intervention? So there's there's many surgeries uh, historically that have been described to preserve swallow function, um, and uh, what we're essentially trying to do is uh, release scars. So imagine radiation is the worst sunburn you ever got. Um, so a lot of times the throat is scarring and areas that are supposed to be open no longer open. So we try to release these scars so things can pass through more easily. Um, there are other types of surgeries that we could do, like change the position of the voice box so that things go down into the lungs less frequently. You can change the position of the voice we box? Could, we could elevate the position of the voice How box. How do you do that? Um, surgically, we essentially, um, we essentially anchor it higher than it should be. No kidding. Yes. Yes. So there are over, um, essentially these muscles that are involved in swallowing scar and they become quite rigid. 
and we, the term is actually woody. So I don't know if you ever felt the neck of anyone who's been radiated. No. I feel it's is it it's like that? As hard as this. Really. And if you feel your own neck, it's soft. So these people, just things don't move anymore. Nothing moves anymore. And so by moving it up or repositioning it, are you taking advantage of muscle that's not that way? Or? It, indeed. We're, we're trying to optimize what we call closure of the voice box so things can go down the correct way. God, that's fascinating. Yes. Yeah, there are over 40 muscles involved in swallowing. That's, I was going to... Yeah. Yeah. And they have to work. After this conversation, I believe that. (laughs) Yeah. No, I mean. Yeah. It's quite remarkable. And they have to work within milliseconds of each other. Something has to close. Something has to open. Something has to elevate. Something has to relax. And if that's not working appropriately, um, you can aspirate. You could have swallowing issues, and you could cough, or you could feel like food's getting stuck. And you call that a pneumonia? Why? I would think of pneumonia as an infection. Am I? Yeah. So eventually, the f- the food festers. Festers. It festers, okay. and, and that's why it becomes a pneumonia. Right. So it's one type of pneumonia. It's an aspiration pneumonia, specifically okay. re- related to food or liquid going down into the lungs. Okay. So the reason neurologic conditions do that is because we're um, miswired, or things are just not working appropriately. So muscles are no longer working or opening or closing. Um, Stroke is a very common Mm. reason. You know, you see people who they have trouble walking or they can't move an arm. Uh, So imagine what what that does to these fine and delicate muscles of the throat and the voice box. Oh, yes. I can only imagine. Right. Have you, um, how has COVID affected your practice? This is, these are all structures that... So, yes. I mean, we, we, I mean, first and foremost, I just want to... I want to give praise to our intensivists and ER doctors who had no choice but to come in and take care of these people day in and day out in the very beginning. Mm. Um, As a specialty, we're fortunate to be able to have, um, to screen our patients before they're com- before they come in mm. um, but essentially you know we are as ENTs yes we are directly exposed to the areas of the body that contain the highest viral mm. load so the nose and the throat <laughs> is that right yes yeah. Yeah. yeah so um, in that sense we are at risk um, but we are protected to some extent um, because again we can screen these mm. patients but yes in terms of um, procedures, And surgeries, we had to take every possible precaution, and that included uh, testing every patient who who we plan to do a type of procedure on, especially invasive in the nose or in the throat, Um, wearing uh, protective um, equipment, personal protective equipment, like goggles and face shields and these these N95 that that filtrate particulate matter. Um, So... Yeah, I mean, it, there was definitely a, a risk there. Did you have Did you have your practice? Um, did you have patients who had to um, wait for procedures because the ERs were or, um, ORs were full and uh, you know that's a, intensive that's care a great units question. were full or yes, there yeah. were uh, unless the pa- unless it was not elective. So um, if it was emergent or urgent, yeah, um, we were allowed to operate on those patients. So things like cancer. Um, or airway issues or bleeding issues. Um, yes, we were allowed to take those patients to the operating yeah. room, but anything else elective had to be deferred. Yeah. Especially during the surges, um, where the ICUs were full. Yeah. Um, and there was no staff available, so all elective surgeries were were stopped. Yeah. So you also um, handle things like vertigo and mm-hmm. things that originate in the in the ear. Mm-hmm. Um, it's fa- vertigo is a fascinating yeah, the, uh, yes, disease. Yes, I would say um, in my mind, um, as fascinating as the voice box is and, and just detailed, I think the ear is, yeah. is probably is, is as much or if not more. I mean, here's a structure that is receiving sound waves and turning these into neurologic impulses that go to our brain. And it's not just one pure frequency, but music, classical music, and somehow this eardrum is transmitting that through bones, through and then eventually through a hydraulic pressure that stimulates a structure called the cochlea, and uh, then that turns into neurologic signals. Wait, that's a hydraulic? Um... Yeah, so the cochlea is encased in fluid. Okay. And then there's a membrane within the cochlea. 
and essentially um, when the pistons which of the ear bones um, are vibrating due to the eardrum vibrating that that fluid and that membrane vibrate fascinating and then there's cells that pick up specific frequencies and um, those all send signals to the brain and that's sound yeah. it's remarkable it and is. then within that you have the balance system yeah <laughs> so. and and yeah and it's doing double duty yeah and, it's, and the balance system. so my mother is you know older 96 years old had mm-hmm. some vertigo and they did an amazing treatment with her where she did something where she laid back and then went forward yes and it was almost like it, it reminded me of hitting kind of control alt delete on a computer because <laughs> yeah. it, it, they said it sort of you know what i'm talking about yeah what is that so that's called a uh, benign positional paroxysmal that's vertigo, it. or people call it bppv um, and there's these structures that we call crystals. Um, in our field, they're called otoliths, um, but they're essentially like minerals and crystals uh, that sense inertia. So if we're moving uh, along a rotation or if we're going up or down, um, they move, and then it sends a signal to our brain that we're moving. Uh, so sometimes those otoliths or those crystals fall out of place. And How big are we talking about here? Oh, we're talking about microscopic. Micros- these are microscopic crystals. Microscopic, yes, inside the inner How ear. How far in? Uh, it, essentially, the bone behind your ear. Right, they're here. Yeah, that's where the inner ear is encased. It's called interesting. The, it's called the temporal bone. Okay, and so it's pretty close to the surface, and it's it's deep. Fish. Oh, it's, it's deep. deep. It's, it's, it's deep. deep into this bone. Okay, and okay. It it's in the bone. It's inside the bone, and it's encased by the densest bone in the human body. Be just to protect it. Right. Yes. Okay, so go on. Sorry. So no, that's okay. Um, So essentially, uh, these microscopic crystals fall out of place, and that positioning mover maneuver is putting them back in. So getting it into... It it seems to work. The people who figure this out are... I can't believe it. Yeah, they're very smart people. Yeah. 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 So are you... uh, Do you get a lot of people in with balance issues, ear issues? We do. Yeah. Yeah, as ENTs, we see a lot of it. And what do you have to do if if vertigo... If that doesn't work for vertigo? So vertigo can be caused by so many different things. Really? Yes. So many different things. It could be caused by um, ENT issues, ear issues. It could be caused by brain issues. Hmm. So the the primary... um, Our primary focus is on understanding what is causing the vertigo initially. Okay. So we do balance tests, we do hearing tests, and ultimately we can find out, hopefully, what it is. If it's not from an ear issue, we typically attribute it to a brain issue. Um, so even things like migraine can cause vertigo. Interesting. Uh, multiple sclerosis can yeah. cause vertigo. Um, tumors, unfortunately, can cause vertigo. Um, and then, again, we have our whole list of ear causes of vertigo, and our job as ENTs is to figure out if it's any one of those. Yeah, it's sort of like your body's gyroscope. It is. It's exactly like Which, your body's gyroscope. Yeah, it has to keep it. Yeah, yeah. So, last thing, how do you interact with your colleagues? Um, you know, the the neurosurgeons and the every the, all the other mm-hmm. um, specialties here. Mm-hmm. So, having the opportunity to be at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute, I am able to work with amazing neurologists and neurosurgeons that commonly deal with these neurologic issues that can result in hoarseness or swallowing issues. So we have a motor neuron specialist who sees um, patients with swallowing issues, voice issues very commonly, very frequently, especially patients with Parkinson's disease. So I'm able to see those patients. Unfortunately, every once in a while, um, a complication of brain surgery can result in a vocal cord paralysis. Um, and swallowing dysfunction, so I'm able to see those patients as well. So what's remarkable here is that rather than um, immediately condemning these patients to a feeding tube in in cases Mm. of severe um, swallowing dysfunction, I'm able to intervene and um, do anything or whatever I can to prevent that. Okay, so you've got you've got a you've got a bench. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, so Again, you know, we have the opportunity here at PNI to, you know, truly um, allow patients to see each one of us nearly the same day. Yeah, I've if heard they, if they I've, have. Yeah, to. I've heard examples of that. Yes, yeah. So very commonly, I get called by the neurosurgeons. I'm seeing this patient postoperatively, and this is what they're describing. Um, can you please see them? Sure, send them downstairs. I'd be happy to. I can you imagine? I mean, patients must just be like, wait, what? Yeah, I'm yes. not seeing one. It's different. Um, it's different from other institutions. Expert, I'm gonna all of a sudden. I, 
I didn't have to go and make another appointment and come back in six weeks. I agree. <laughs> I, yeah, I, and a lot of times these are patients who it's really difficult for them to leave the home. Right. You know, so it's just so nice to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I know they appreciate it. Yeah, fantastic. Well, Dr. Metazade, it's been a pleasure. I, it's my uh, pleasure. I just, I want to go read more books about um, vocal cords now. Well, let me know if you have any questions. I sure will. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful, my pleasure. Thank you.